Hello, I'm Karen Ginoni. This is Outside Saw. And what's being described as a mysterious Russian satellite displaying very abnormal behaviour raises alarm in the UK. A 12-month state of emergency has been declared in northwestern Italy following yesterday's bridge disaster in Genoa. 39 people were killed, at least three of them are children. Let's just show you some of the latest pictures out of Genoa, some incredible aerial footage of the scene. You really get a sense of how huge the bridge was. Almost 40 vehicles plunged off it when it collapsed. They fell 45 metres. The rescue effort has sadly, though, turned a corner. It's uh, been from searching for survivors, but now people are searching for bodies. Sniffer dogs have been brought in to help. It's hot and it's heavy work. Very dangerous for the firefighters, too. Many parts of the rubble are still unstable. Just look at this rescuer pretty much suspended from what seems to be a car wreck. Of the 39 victims, 37 have been identified. Among them, a family of three. They were on their way to Sardinia for a summer holiday. Their little son, Samuel, was one of the first victims to be recovered. And this is Andrea Cerulli, a keen amateur footballer with a toddler son. He was on his way to work. This is Elisa Bozzo. She recently wrote on her Facebook page, how can I not celebrate life? But there are also amazing stories of survival. My colleague James Reynolds spoke to a British family about their harrowing experience. We were... Well, another survivor who's now recovering in hospital survived the fall when his car landed in a pocket between the cement columns. Now, he didn't want his face to be shown, but he did speak to the media. Well, there is now talk of massive fines for the company that looks after the maintenance of the bridge and the Genoa Prosecutor's Office has opened an investigation into possible negligent homicide. Italy's transport minister is angry, he wants heads to roll at the company and has promised to hold it accountable. Here he is at the scene. Why is it she well, the maintenance company says it had checked the bridge every three months using highly specialised techniques. The Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte has said all infrastructure across Italy will now be double-checked. Here he is speaking earlier. Tim Wilcox. It's Liberation Day in the Korean Peninsula. That's a holiday marking independence from Japanese colonial rule. Let's take a look at some of the pictures from South Korea on Wednesday. It's a ceremony in Seoul. You can see people waving flags. An optimistic note from the president there. Compare the celebrations we just saw in the south with the north. Let's just show you what was broadcast. This was state TV. It's been two months since the historic summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. This is the document. You'll remember both leaders signed back then. Since then, negotiations have stalled. North Korea wants the US to drop its sanctions. Pyongyang says it's made a number of goodwill gestures. But this, uh, you'll know we showed you earlier this month, this image from the satellite appearing to show key facilities being dismantled at the Sohai launch site. That's North Korea's main missile engine, engine testing site. But the US is pushing for total denuclearization before any sanctions are eased. Now, the relationship between these two men, Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in, does seem much warmer. North and South Korea are preparing for a third meeting in the demilitarized zone next week. Let's bring in Daniel Russell, who is Vice President for International Security and Diplomacy at the Asia Society Policy Institute. He also served under President Obama in East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Daniel Russell, welcome to you, speaking from New York. I mean, as North and South Korea mark Liberation Day in what's been a very dramatic day, a year of developments, how do you view where things stand right now? 30 men and one woman have been charged with offences linked to child sexual exploitation in Huddersfield. Many of the accused are thought to be British Pakistanis. Emma Glasby reports from Huddersfield. Brazil has a presidential election coming up, and this man, the former president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, known as Lula, wants to run for office, but there's a problem. He's currently serving a 12-year prison sentence for corruption, and he's barely four months in. This hasn't deterred his supporters, though, because they have been marching through the streets of the capital, Brasilia. That march will end with the top members of Lula's Workers' Party registering his candidacy here at the Electoral Court just before the deadline in a couple of hours' time. This registration is expected to be fraught with complications. I asked Katie Watson to tell us why. Katie Watson speaking to me last hour. 
There's more economic tension between the U.S. and Turkey. Steve Herman is White House Bureau Chief for Voice of America, and about an hour and a half ago, he tweeted sanctions, but not steel tariffs in place on Turkey, would be lifted if Brunson is released, says the White House press secretary. Well, this comes on the day when the Turkish lira did regain some of the ground it's lost against the dollar recently. It's just over six lira for one U.S. dollar now, so going up a bit... Uh, uh, some of that reason is that Turkey's President Erdogan has announced new tariffs on imports from the US, as Mark Lowen in Istanbul explains. Mark Lowen, so all of that turmoil is putting enormous economic strain on Turkey. One country that knows about stuff like that just across the Aegean, Greece. It's a country still feeling the effects of its infamous debt crisis of a few years ago. In the capital, Athens, property prices crashed, which allowed foreign investors to pick up bargains and rent them out. But that is causing tensions with locals, as Philip Hampshire reports now from Athens. Well, staying with housing, let's go to New Zealand, where the government's just passed a law banning overseas buyers from purchasing existing homes. Today, the associate housing minister said that New Zealanders should not be tenants in our own land. The country has become what some bit call a billionaire's bolt hole. For people like the American tech billionaire Peter Thiel, he is property here in very beautiful Queenstown in the South Island, and this could be why people like him are buying there. This is the Guardian headline, why Silicon Valley billionaires are prepping for the apocalypse in New Zealand. It says it all, really. The idea being that they're buying New Zealand property as a safe space to ride out an end-of-days scenario. Outside source producer Brownie Sowden has more. Brian Sowden reporting there. Stay with us on Outside Source. Coming up in our next half in a few minutes' time, we'll bring you the latest on what's being described as a mysterious Russian satellite displaying very abnormal behaviour. See you soon. Hello, I'm Karen Ginoni. This is Outside Source. Well, as we mentioned there in that last headline, we talked about Paul Manafort before. He used to be Donald Trump's campaign manager. He's been on trial facing 18 charges of tax and banking crimes. He's denied all the charges against him. His lawyers made their final arguments today. Chris Buckler has been following this story. Chris, what's the latest from court? Today, the UN Special Representative for Afghanistan appealed for violence to end, saying that the extreme human suffering caused by the fighting in Ghazni highlights the urgent need for the war to end. Sana Safi from the BBC Pashto service spoke to me earlier. This is not the first time that um, whoever is behind this attack has targeted such a soft target. In the past, mosques were attacked, education centers in similar Shia neighborhoods were attacked. So, um, and this is why most people blame ISIS for it rather than Taliban. Taliban themselves have obviously denied it. Yeah, and why, I mean, have the, are the Taliban pretty careful when it is an extremely soft target, when children are among the casualties? Are they pretty careful to point out this wasn't them? And how much can we take that at face value? I think they have done that in the past, whenever there was, uh, the casualty numbers were high, whenever the targets were civilians or children mostly, they have denied responsibility. Um, but most Afghans uh, blame this attack on the Taliban as well because they think that the reason they're denying it is because they know that there are children involved. Now the violence comes hours after the Taliban said it would no longer give safe passage to Red Cross staff. That's over a prisoner row. Militants say Taliban prisoners held in Kabul's jail are in a terrible state of health, warning that the ICRC would be held responsible for anything that happened to them. The ICRC is, of course, a neutral organization. It's been offering aid and monitoring detention centers, even in areas under Taliban control. Last year, they had to scale back their operation after six workers were shot dead by suspected Islamic State gunmen. Today, the ICRC told the BBC it was hoping to find a solution so that they can continue their humanitarian work. Uh, this is one tweet from the New York Times' Afghan correspondent saying, but even for Taliban standards, today was a new low. Here's Sana speaking to me about that. There are concerns that this will jeopardize their efforts in the country and, and as a whole because they're the main providers of um, not just health care but like assistance to prisoners and uh, to some of the most insecure or some of the most remote parts of the country when there is uh, such attacks or there are problems. But Taliban's um, reasoning for this is that there has been uh, hunger strike in one of the main jails in Kabul and the hunger strike 
has been called by Taliban prisoners. And Taliban are saying that this is a response to Rich Cross's inability to provide for their prisoners in the capital. That's why they will no longer um, stand by that agreement that they did with the Rich Cross um, a while back, that they will not be targeted and they will be, uh, sa their safety will be guaranteed. Sana, why are we seeing so many attacks in Afghanistan now at this particular moment? It depends who you ask these questions, and different people have different answers. So if you ask government sympathizers, they will tell you that um, the reason is that the Afghan, the Afghan army is, compared to the number of attacks, compared to the demand, the Afghan army cannot be trained fast enough because they're losing pe people every day um, on, in such large-scale attacks. And then criticals of the government, people who oppose the government or they're critical of the government, they will tell you that it's because of the internal bickering, the government's inability to outsmart the Taliban, um, or their lack of understanding to equip local police with the right um, equipment or weaponry so they can defend themselves, like in Ghazni, for example. Um, there was no, had they been properly equipped, they, had, uh, they would have defended the city to Georgina Smythe, who's a BBC journalist here in the newsroom. And Georgina, I mean, first of all, what's the general public reaction been like? Well, widespread condemnation in Australia certainly set the tone for this response. As we've seen, um, Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull uh, has rejected the comments. Opposition leader Bill Shorten labelled them as repugnant. Um, but surprise, the most sort of surprising reaction has been from Pauline Hanson. Um, she labelled the speech as appalling, despite also calling for a ban on Muslim immigration in 2016. So it's certainly not the first time we've seen a stunt or comments like this in Australian politics. It's unlikely to be the last. Um, despite Australia's um, tight control of its borders, immigration is a hot topic. It's incredibly divisive and it's something that people enjoy talking about. Mr Anning uh, made some heavy allusions to the white Australia policy in his speech, um, which of course was the, um, the banning of non-Europeans uh, immigrating to Australia until the 1960s when it was abolished. But here we can see the legacy is still very much alive um, and, and themes around those policies still very much inform the discourse on immigration in Australia. So I suppose similar to uh, public opinion in the UK after uh, former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson's comments on the burqa, very controversial comments. People in Australia and voters in Australia enjoy having representatives that say things that others won't and they'll continue to vote them in. Tell us about this party, the Qatar Australian Party, that he is a member of. Qatar's Australian Party is a minor party in Australia. Um, it represents a very conservative region in far north Queensland. Uh, Bob Catter is its very outspoken and a Kubra hat wearing leader. Uh, he's known for being very controversial in his comments. So in a sense his support of his senator doesn't come as a surprise. Um, his small minor party, like other minor parties in Australia, they really anchor this, themselves in with a few key issues and they, they uh, defend these key issues quite aggressively. They're quite good at igniting public opinion as they have done now. Um, so they, they really sort of um, help set an agenda in Australian politics. So despite the fact that they're quite small, um, they often are quite good at breaking monopolies in the upper and lower house of Australian Parliament. So despite the fact that they're small, they look minor, they actually can have a big say on big issues. So they can be influential when they want to be. Georgie, thanks very much. Georgina Smythe. Stay with us on Outside Source still to come. Dave Lee speaking to me earlier from San Francisco. Just to recap on our top story, a 12-month state of emergency has been declared in the Liguria region in northwestern Italy following yesterday's bridge disaster in Genoa. 39 people are known to have been killed. At least three of them are children. I'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Thanks for watching.